It's so awesome to be together on such a beautiful morning. Uh, you might say a silent prayer for Brother Mason, who's in surgery right now. Um, so let's keep him in prayer. Pray for the doctor's wisdom to know exactly what to do in that surgery for him. Thank you for all your prayers uh, during my mother's illness and decline and her passing. Uh, we do take great comfort in the fact that she is at home with the Lord. So have you ever had a mountaintop experience? Mountaintop experiences are those moments in our lives when we feel God's presence in a glorious and powerful way, in a, in a way that we don't experience just in our everyday moments in life. Perhaps you've had one of those Moments when you were in a beautiful or inspiring place. Maybe it was on top of a mountain like we do the men's mountain hike every year. Or maybe it was at the ocean and you were observing the power and majesty of, of the waters. Or maybe it's at the Grand Canyon if you've been there. That's kind of an awe-inspiring place, isn't it? When you're in those places, you feel God's presence and glory. Maybe for you, the time came in a moment of crisis or desperation. Perhaps in a hospital room, or on your knees in prayer, or not knowing how that bill was going to get paid, or where you were going to have the next job or place to live. And, and, and in those moments, you, you felt God's presence and His peace come over you, and, and then maybe God moved in a miraculous way to take care of the need. But those moments are precious, and they're unforgettable. And we wish we could hold on to them, you know, just, just bottle it up and keep it for some future moment when you need it. But those kinds of experiences can't be controlled. They can't be manufactured. Today, as we return to our sermon series on the life of Peter that we've called The Touch of the Master's Hand, we're going to witness Peter and James and John as they literally have a mountaintop experience. Today's story from the life of Peter happens about a week after the story we looked at last time, where Peter declares Jesus is the Christ, and then moments later he's corrected by Jesus when he told Jesus, you're not going to die. Peter was still learning and growing, and we're going to see some more of those growing pains in today's story. So let's see what Peter learned on the mountain, and let's see what we can learn from his experience. Although today's story is told in three of the four Gospels, in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're going to look at Luke's version, because Luke adds some details that are not included in the other two. The story begins in verse 28 of Luke chapter 9. Now about eight days after these sayings, the ones we looked at last time, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. So what, what, what mountain was it that Jesus went up on with those three? Over the years, there have been several that have been suggested. One has been Mount Tabor. That was kind of a favorite one for a while. Uh, but then later excavation showed something on Mount Tabor. It showed a Roman uh, garrison and fort. And that likely wouldn't be a good place for some private prayer or for the transfiguration. So... Anyhow, that, that one kind of fell, uh, fell away. The, the mountain's most likely Mount Hermon, which makes sense because it sits 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee in that region called Caesarea Philippi. And if that sounds familiar, that's where we were in our story last time. In Matthew 16, 13, Jesus was in the region of Caesarea Philippi when Peter made the great confession. And... Uh, and so, if he's there for the great confession just days before this, there's a good chance that it was Mount Hermon that they were on for the transfiguration. And what did Jesus initially go up on the mountain to do? He went up on the mountain to pray. So here we see again, Jesus, God himself, the Son of God, needing prayer, being committed to prayer. And it's no surprise that some of the most significant experiences in the earthly life of Jesus took place during times of prayer. That ought to teach us something, don't you think? The story continues in verse 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became 
dazzling white. Both Mark and Matthew describe what happened, saying that Jesus was transfigured before them. Luke doesn't use that word. The Greek word that Mark and, and Matthew use for transfigured is the one we get the English word metamorphosis from, which means a change on the outside from within. Jesus was changed from an ordinary looking man into a figure of light with brilliant beams radiating from his body. The reason his clothes were white was because of the light emanating from within him. You can see how Luke's trying to describe this otherworldly experience, saying his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. There's a big difference between the glory that emanated from Jesus at the transfiguration and the glory that shone on the face of Moses when he came off Mount Sinai. Moses had been in the presence of God for those days. And in the presence of the eternal light of God, Moses then reflected or radiated that light. A little like something that is, has glow-in-the-dark properties when it's under a lamp for a while and then you take it into a dark place, it emanates the light. It's not its own light. It's this absorbed light that it's reflecting. In contrast to that, the light that shone from Jesus emanated from within him. For, for most of Jesus' 30-some years on earth, his human flesh had obscured and veiled his deity. But in this moment, his true divine nature shone forth. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of God's glory. And the word glory carries with it the idea of glowing brilliance. Remember when the angels came to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth, and the Bible says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. Brilliant lights associated with the character and nature of God. The Bible tells us that God is holy and that God is love and that God is light. Sometimes people refer to the Shekinah glory of God. And the word Shekinah is a Hebrew word that doesn't actually appear in the Bible, but it appears in other Hebrew literature. But it's used to describe this light glory of God or cloud glory of God, like the Shekinah glory that, that appeared above the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim in the most holy place of the temple. And so as the glory of God was emanating from Jesus on the mountain, something else really remarkable occurred. The Bible says in verse 30, and behold... Two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And so the appearance of Moses and Elijah greatly you know, improved the impressiveness of the scene, right? Moses and Elijah were representatives of the Hebrew religion. Moses representing the embodiment of the law, and Elijah representing all of the prophets. Interestingly enough, in both their cases, they each had mountaintop experiences of their own, didn't they? And they each had very unusual departures from the earth. Moses' mountaintop experience came on Sinai with the giving of the law. Elijah's mountaintop experience happened on Mount Carmel with the showdown with the prophets of Baal. Moses... His life ended. He died and was buried on the lonely heights of Mount Nebo, buried by God himself in an unknown grave. And of course, you know the story of Elijah. How did he exit? He didn't die. He hopped on a fiery chariot and was swept up into heaven. But why had the two of them shown up on this occasion? They had come to talk with Jesus about his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, interestingly enough, the word departure here is the word exodus. They were talking with him about his upcoming 
Exodus. How he would go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many things, be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. And remember, just a week earlier, when Jesus first announced that this was going to happen, Peter said, no, this will never happen to you. Jesus called him Satan, right? But now these great leaders of the Jewish faith have showed up to talk with him about these things. I believe they were there to tell Jesus, you're on the right path, and encourage him to continue. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, it would be an angel who would come to minister and strengthen Jesus in the moments before his arrest and crucifixion. But now it was Moses and Elijah who were chosen to be emissaries of the eternal world. They stood on Jesus' left and right, assuring Him of the Father's sustaining help, assuring Him of the glory that would be accomplished by these things through His sacrifice. And along with Moses and Elijah, I think we can picture the great cloud of witnesses, right? They they weren't shown being present, but they're present. They're always present. And, and, And their intense interest in the ministry of Jesus as he stepped into the stadium to run that last lap in his great race, to fight the last battle of his spiritual war, the cross itself. So meanwhile, while all this is going on, what are James and John and Peter doing? The Bible says they were sleeping. Yes. And now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. So they had gone up on the mountain to pray. And maybe it took them all day to walk up that mountain, like it does take us to walk up some of those mountains in the Adirondacks. And when they got to the top, perhaps it was nighttime, and they started to pray, and they did what we often all do. They fell asleep in prayer, right? Now, the Bible doesn't say this occurred at nighttime, but it seems likely that it did. The, the episode after, the Bible says, on the next day when they came down from the mountain, a great cloud, crowd met them. But I can imagine how much more impressive this scene would be at night than in the daytime, right? While they were praying in the dark, Peter and John fell asleep. But then they were suddenly awoken by this brilliant light and the voices of Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, I've been startled out of a deep sleep before, and you probably have too, right? Maybe it's a thunderstorm that wakes you up, or, or maybe it's the needs of your child as they're looking at you right in your face, you know? And when you're startled out of your sleep, there's this kind of cloudiness or, or fog that has to clear before you can think straight, right? And can you imagine the fogginess of their thinking when all of this happens, okay? Okay, where, where are we? Oh, yeah, okay, we're on a mountain with Jesus, and we're praying. Okay, but what is this light? And what are Moses and Elijah doing here? Imagine the fogginess of all of that. And so it's not surprising then that Peter, in his his usual impetuous enthusiasm, and with the groggy fog of sleep, would say the wrong thing. The Bible says, As the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. So so Peter began with the obvious. It's good that we're here. Yes, Peter, it is good that we are here. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Yes, indeed. And no wonder Peter wanted to stay there. We would have wanted to stay there too. But Peter made this wrong suggestion. Let's build three tents or tabernacles. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. I'm not sure if the purpose of those tents was for worship 
or for a place to dwell. But either way, it's not the right suggestion, right? If Peter was proposing a place to worship each of them, only one of them deserved a place of worship, right? You don't worship Moses or Elijah, but you worship Jesus. And if Peter was proposing a place for each of them to live, staying on the mountain was the last place where Jesus and Moses and Elijah needed to be. Jesus needed to go to Jerusalem to be crucified and resurrected. Moses and Elijah needed to return to their blessed residence and ministry in heaven. Now, Matthew's gospel doesn't make any evaluation or judgment upon Peter's statement. But Luke's and Mark's gospels do. Luke basically says, Peter didn't know what he was saying. Mark's gospel says, Peter did not know what to say. They were so frightened. And if Mark's gospel is really the gospel according to Peter, in other words, Peter conveyed to him his ideas as they were relatives, and, and so it's Peter's memories and, and Mark's pen, then we know from Peter's perspective why he said what he said. But anyhow, Peter's wrong suggestion didn't need to be corrected by Jesus or Moses or Elijah because God the Father stepped in and did the correction. The Bible says, as he was saying these things, you know, the words are just coming out of his mouth, a cloud came and overshadowed them. and They were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And so God the Father shows up, envelops them in a cloud. This is the Shekinah cloud, the one that led God's people in the wilderness by day and the night and, and the fire by night, right? The Shekinah cloud that filled Solomon's temple on its dedication. The Shekinah cloud that hid Jesus as he made his ascension into, into heaven. From the cloud, the voice says, This is my son. Listen to him. In other words, there's only one important one standing here. It's not Moses. It's not Elijah. It's Jesus. And the words to be obeyed and heard and listened to now are not the words of the law or the words of the prophets, but the words of Jesus. And as quickly as all this had happened, the transfiguration of Jesus the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the cloud and the voice, it all disappeared. And the Bible says, and, and when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Mark's account says it like this, and suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. Matthew says, And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So what, what terrifying and yet exhilarating experience this must have been. Think about what they'd seen. Think about what they had heard. They had seen Jesus glowing with the glory of God. They had seen Moses and Elijah risen from the dead. They had seen the cloud of God envelop them. They had heard Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus about the crucifixion to come. And they had heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Obey Jesus. Now, it's obvious why Jesus told them to keep this to themselves until after the resurrection. 
Imagine the chaos it would have caused amongst the other apostles had they come down off the mountain and shared this news with them, right? How would you like to have been one of the nine that missed out on this thing, right? And imagine the chaos it would have caused for the followers of Jesus, the crowd, and the critics. This powerful truth about the identity of Jesus needed to be shared at the right time. Prior to the crucifixion and resurrection was not the right time to share it. So what lessons can we learn and apply from this story today? Peter's training as a disciple. Well, first of all, we learn not to fall asleep in our prayer time, right? Well, we might learn that, but that's not our lesson. Seriously, though, the first thing we learn is to see God's glory, we need to visit the mountaintop and worship. When I suggest visiting the mountaintop, I'm using that figuratively, not literally. God's not found on the mountaintop alone. He might be found there, but that's not the only place. What I'm suggesting is we need to pull ourselves away from the everyday hustle and bustle of life in order to draw closer to God. And and praise God, we're doing that this morning together. That was something Jesus did regularly. He'd get up early and go to the solitary place to pray. He would dismiss the crowds. He would find a place to pray. In today's story, he took Peter, James, and John to the mountaintop to pray. And when we seek God in the quiet place of worship and prayer and meditation in Scripture study, we will find God and we will experience the power of God's presence. Ultimately, we must listen to God. And God alone. And as we seek God in this way, we must be sure it is God whom we are seeking and finding. There are many other competing voices out there, right? There's the inner voice that can be very loud. There's the voice of culture. There's the voice of our friends and family. And as we learned in our study last time, Satan can use the voice of anyone. We must be careful to seek God in the kinds of places where He's told us to look for Him. In Scripture, in prayer, in the body of Christ. But ultimately, many people seek God in the wrong places. Like the woman in New Mexico who thought she found Jesus in her fried tortilla. (laughs) Or the man in Poland who thought he found the Virgin Mary in the bark of a tree. Or a lady in Arkansas who thought she found Jesus in the kitchen light of her trailer. Many people visited her kitchen light to see. Charged them a dollar to look at it. One of the men came out disappointed, said he looked more like Willie Nelson to me. (laughs) If we want to see God's glory, we don't need to look in a tortilla or a tree or a trailer We need to look into God's Word. And we can go to any of the Gospels, especially John chapter 1, or we can go to Colossians 1, or Hebrews 1, or Revelation 1. And I love this picture of Jesus, right? Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. To see God's glory, we need to visit the mountaintop in worship. But number two, we learn to see God's glory, we need to leave the mountaintop and serve. Peter wanted to stay on the mountain. And and that's the danger of the mountaintop experience. We want to linger there. We don't want to leave. It's like vacation, right? Who wants to leave vacation and go back to work or school or wherever, right? We want to stay on vacation permanently. But life is not lived on the mountaintop, but in the valley. 
It's important to regularly go to the mountaintop, but we can't stay there. We need to return to the valley to serve God and others. A man once told evangelist D.L. Moody, I've been on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus for the past five years. Moody asked him during that time, how many people have you won to Christ? And the man said, none. And Moody replied, we don't need that kind of mountaintop experience. Where a man gets so high he can't reach down and help sinners, there is something wrong. You know, this is the classic Mary versus Martha conflict, right? There are some folks who never leave the valley for the mountaintop. Folks like that will work and work and work for Jesus, but they don't visit the mountaintop and enjoy sweet intimacy with God. And to them, worship and Bible study and spiritual retreat or quiet time are a waste of time. They look with disdain at the mountaintop worshipers. They wonder when they're going to come down and get to work, like Mary looking at Martha, or like Martha looking at Mary from the other room. And then there are some people who only want to spend time in worship on the mountaintop. Folks like that enjoy the feeling of security and serenity that comes from being alone with the Lord, and they look down on the workers who don't see the value of communing with the Lord. And so the mountain toppers like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, while the valley workers are like Martha banging pots and pans in the kitchen. What we need to learn is the value of both parts of walking with God, right? The times of worship, the times of service, the mountaintops and the valleys. The mountaintop times of worship aren't the only times we feel the closeness of God. It's often when we share our faith or serve others that we feel close to God as well. What an awesome feeling it is when you know you're being used by God to minister to someone else, to accomplish His good purposes. And it's only in sharing and serving that we're stretched beyond our own power and wisdom and truly experience the power and wisdom of God. So let's be sure to spend enough time on the mountaintop and the valley to experience God's glory, to allow it to transform us and empower us to bring glory to God. So have you seen God's glory? I hope you have. I hope you see it regularly in your mountaintop worship times. I hope you see it clearly in your times of service as well.